Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can you give a thumbs up if you can hear me? Great. Um, good afternoon to everyone here at the wonderful Cedar Rapids Museum of Art. And good afternoon to everyone joining us online. I see from Zoom that there are a number of people from the Haas family online. So welcome to you. Um, I need no introduction to you, but I will reintroduce myself slightly. Um, I am Valerie Valent, and I head up the Historic Artists Homes and Studios Program, which is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This is a consortium of 55 independent um, museums and historic sites that are all open to the public in 25 states in this glorious union um, and all were the former homes and working studios of um, American artists and collectively we draw 1 million visitors a year and those artists represented in the network sites span three centuries and collectively represent the artists of the legacies of over 300 artists and of course I want to extend my thanks to Maura Pilcher um, for It Takes a Village, and she's one person to create um, something as um, amazing as this three-day experience. I want to thank the Grantwood Art Colony, and I also want to thank um, the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art and in particular, a uh, speaker who will come up shortly, but Sean Elmer, who is the executive director here at the museum, who just gave all of us an incredible um, experience, along with curatorial staff here at the museum of the Grant Wood Studio, proving once again that no matter how great these papers are, it is a poor imitation of standing in the space. It never gets old, the awe and wonder is always the same, and I urge everyone to use this as a jumping off point to go and discover not only Grant Wood Studio, go back again, but also any number of other places um, represented in the Haas Network, but beyond. I want to just say that this closing plenary includes staff and scholars from three Haas sites. So we've heard throughout the three days, papers that include sites within the network, sites without the network, but today is from practitioners working and inhabiting and activating those spaces today. And the selection is a great representation of the breadth of Haas. One is a converted loft uh, in a carriage barn, one a former fishing shack, and one um, of pretty typical vernacular Victorian home with a dark room in the closet. And why that's important is it is a reminder that these works of art that are so incredibly well known and that we revere as part of American art and culture were often produced in incredibly humble spaces. Likewise, these three particular artists, I think represent sort of the core of the diversity in Haas. So you have Pollock, who should just be Pollock. <laughs> Whether you know paintings by Pollock or not, you've heard the name. You have Grant Wood, who's American Gothic, almost everybody knows, although perhaps not that it's Grant Wood or anything about the artist. And then you have Alice Austin, an incredibly compelling, and um, just that story is gonna draw you in, someone you may discover for the first time today. And the sites themselves also represent Haas and its diversity. To stand on the floor at the Pollock studio is transformative. It is something that cannot be replicated anywhere else in terms of understanding process. To be in the Grantwood studio is to remember that artists consistently tinker and expand their spaces using other types of disciplines. And in terms of Alice Austin, the environment itself and the context in which she created her works in terms of her views just across the Verrazano Narrows to New York City. They say context is everything and Haas is about context. And you will learn more about that through these wonderful papers. I'm just gonna introduce briefly each of our speakers right now in turn and then allow them to come up to the podium. 
Sean Ulmer, as I said, is the executive director of the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, which are the owners and operators of the Grantwood Studio. And prior to becoming executive director in 2014, he served as the curator of collections and exhibitions at this same museum for nine years. So a former curator of my own heart. He has more than 25 years of curatorial experience, including over 120 exhibitions and inquiring numerous works of art. And he is also responsible for several exhibition catalogs. And for a longer um, example of the biography, I urge you to look in your um, program. Victoria Monroe is the executive director of the Alice Austin House a nationally designated site of LGBTQ plus history and the only museum in this country to represent the work of one woman photographer, Alice Austin. Victoria is an art and art history educator, maker and photographer, and she consults and speaks on LGBTQ plus curriculum development, historical and current LGBTQ interpretations in public and private institutions. And lastly, um, I have Helen Harrison, who is the uh, Eugene V. and Claire Ethaw Director of the Paula Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton in New York, and is a former New York Times art critic and NPR arts curator, commentator, excuse me. She has been a curator at the Guild Hall Museum and the Parish Art Museum, also um, out on East End of Long Island and taught at the school of visual arts and currently holds an adjunct faculty position at Stony Brook University. Um, I like Zach, this is the first time I have been in an in-person convening since March of 2019. And I am just so grateful for the energy and um, hospitality that we have experienced over these three days. And um, I look forward to hearing these last three papers. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Good afternoon. I thank you for inviting me to speak with you about the Grantwood Studio. Um, before I begin, I'd like to take a moment, to, uh, just a moment to thank uh, both the Grantwood Art Colony uh, for organizing this symposium and the Historic Artists Homes and Studios Program for sponsoring uh, this afternoon's session. The Grantwood Studio was never meant to be a studio at all. It is at its very core, a hayloft. This rather compact 975 square foot space with its sloping ceiling and exterior staircase was nothing more than the second story of a carriage barn, which housed several carriages and horses uh, and used to draw them. It was a brick structure uh, built to accompany a Georgian revival style mansion constructed in the mid to late 1890s by George Bruce Douglas, Jr. George Douglas, along with his brother Walter, were the co-founders of the Douglas Starch Works, an important early company in Cedar Rapids, which by 1914 was the largest starch works company in the world. He was also the son of industrialist George Douglas, Sr., a Scotsman who with Robert Stewart founded Douglas and Stewart Cereal Mill, which eventually became known as Quaker Oats. George Douglas Jr. and his family lived in the house until 1906, when they arranged a rather unprecedented house swap with Carolyn Sinclair, widow of Thomas Sinclair, founder of the Sinclair Meatpacking Plant. Mrs. Sinclair felt that her home, an 1886 brick Victorian, uh, then outskirts of Cedar Rapids, was too large for her family, and the Douglases, in turn, wanted more property in order to plant formal gardens, which they did, as well as installing servants' quarters, greenhouses, and caretakers' cottages. They renamed the property Bruce Moore, using George Douglas's middle name, Bruce. The 26-acre property is now part of the National Trust, to which it was donated by George's daughter, Margaret Hall, upon her death in 1981. 
but back to the Georgian Revival home, now occupied by Mrs. Sinclair and her family. It was during the Sinclair's time at this property that they decided to have the carriage house moved about 40 feet away from the main house. They owned the adjacent lots, so they were able, so they had the space to expand, but the exact reason for the move is unknown. In 1917, 11 years after the house swap, Mrs. Sinclair passed away and the property was occupied by her son, who in turn sold it in 1923 to John B. Turner, a local mortuary owner whose nearby funeral home had grown too small for his business. John B. Turner and his son David employed a friend of his son's, one Grant Wood, to help convert the mansion into a funeral home. The Turners added a large wing to one side of the mansion and Wood designed, among other things, the rose-colored bay window in front of which the bodies were laid. It was John B. Turner and his son David who invited Grant Wood to use the hayloft as a potential studio where they no longer needed the space uh, as a hayloft as their hearses were all motorized by this period. This was a critical moment for Grant Wood. The hayloft reminded him of the garret he had occupied with his good friend Marvin Cohn on their trip to Paris in the summer of 1920. No sooner had he stepped inside the hayloft uh, than he started to think that with a little clever remodeling, he could transform this space to be not only a studio, but also a place to live. Drawing upon his arts and crafts background, that's exactly what he did. And he moved in full time in 1925, bringing along his aging mother and frequently housing his sister as well. Not having to pay rent or a mortgage allowed Wood to give up his teaching position at McKinley Junior High School and paint full time. Wood lived and worked in the Grant Wood studio until 1935, when he moved to Iowa City to assume a teaching position at the University of Iowa. It was in the studio that Grant Wood created some of his most famous and iconic paintings, including American Gothic. The Cedar Rapids Museum of Art received the Grant Wood studio in 2002 as a gift from the Lingy family. They own and operate Cedar Memorial, the successors to Turner Mortuary. However, as they say, there are no free puppies. Since that time, the studio has witnessed two major renovation projects. First, to shore up the structure and to convert the first floor garage into a visitor center, including the insertion of an I-beam between the first and second floors to keep the second floor up on the second floor. <laughs> Then, several years later, a second project to restore and preserve the exterior envelope of the structure, removing all of the lead-based paint, restoring the original windows, gutters, downspouts, and securing the cupola. Neither project was inexpensive, but with the help of various donors, foundations, and historic preservation grants, we were able to accomplish this vitally important work, which totaled approximately $1 million. Despite all of this work, however, the interior of the studio itself remains relatively unchanged. We have been exceptionally careful not to make any significant changes to the studio proper until we determine all of the interior work that needs to be done. We have had analyses conducted of the various paint layers and later modifications, for the studio was more or less continuously occupied by tenants from the time Wood left in 1935 until as recently as 2000. These tenants made changes to suit their needs, including modernizing the kitchen, inserting an air conditioning unit, uh, as well as other updates. We have been in the process of removing some of these changes slowly, as well as discussing to what moment in history to return the, to return the interior, Significant to these discussions is the fact that the studio suffered a major fire during Grant Wood's time there, forcing him to replace the original floor, which had been scored and painted to look like ceramic tiles, with the one that is seen today. Since we have no intention of tearing up the present floor, something Wood laid himself, 
That provides us with the terminus post whim of 1932, the date of the fire. What does that mean for our visitors? How do we provide a rewarding experience to a in a relatively empty space? Our efforts to provide an engaging educational experience are perhaps best demonstrated by walking you through a visit to the Grant Wood studio. After parking in the lot or walking the three short blocks from the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, the visitor is asked to enter the visitor service, the visitor center first. Here a staff member greets the guests and, the, uh, and explains that the tours for the studio are by docent guide only and that they are welcome to watch the introductory 30 minute film on the life of Grant Wood or view some of the other materials available in the visitor center for their perusal. We ask them to sign in, but we take no fees for the admission costs to the studios has been subsidized by a significant grant from the Esther and Robert Armstrong Charitable Trust. The film screen, Grant Wood and Me, was something we produced for our major 2005 exhibition of the work of Grant Wood, celebrating the acquisition and opening of the Grant Wood studio. It provides a nice overview of the life of Grant Wood and introduces viewers to some of the better known works as well as many other works, such as his early metal pieces, which the docents will speak to more directly on their guided tours. It also allows the docent to concentrate less on the biography of Grant Wood and more on, the, uh, on what he produced while in the studio. Other materials in the visitor center include copies of newspaper clippings and books about Grant Wood. At the conclusion of the film, the docent who has just finished up his or her previous half hour tour upstairs appears and gathers up the next group. This requires leaving the visitor center in which, which, at which time the docent discusses uh, the nearby Turner Mortuary and Wood's role at that place. Rounding the corner, the visitors proceed up the modern stairs, and stop at the top to look at Wood's unique door. Originally, wooden stairs had been built in the opposite direction and the access to them was from the alley, which is how the studio also became known as Five Turner Alley. The door, a facsimile of the original housed at the nearby Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, was fashioned from a coffin lid, obviously readily available, in which Wood crafted a dial to inform prospective visitors whether he was in or out, and if the latter, when he was returning. It also let visitors know if he was having a party, out of town, or even taking a bath. Not only does this door betray Wood's sense of humor, there was a practical side for this as well. Since Wood was a very popular man about town, making friends wherever he went, the people of Cedar Rapids, many of whom supported Wood's work, felt almost as if they owned him and oftentimes felt no hesitation to walk right into his space without knocking or being invited in. So this door, with all of its whimsy, served both as an artistic creation as well as having a very practical function. Upon passing through the door, the visitor is required to navigate a half story of narrow stairs with a modern day railing to assist. For many years, people used the more rustic chain link railing opposite until the faux black end plates began to deteriorate. They are not forged of wrought iron as they appear, but rather are painted cardboard no doubt saving the frugal artist some expense. At the top of the stairs, the visitor enters a single large space, which served as a living, eating, working, and sleeping quarters for Grant Wood, his mother Hattie, and on occasion his sister Nan Wood Graham. The volunteer docents share several of Wood's modifications that transform this hayloft into a home and studio for 11 years. These include the installation of a fireplace to warm the space. The hood is a metal bushel bucket turned upside down. Originally, they heated their tea on the hood. The so-called hot dog stand, a drop down eating space for Wood and his mother with a pass through from the kitchen. A seating area, although the table is a later addition. 
the sleeping area where the single beds would be tucked under the eave and shielded from view by curtains during the daytime. The storage cabinets above could house not only painting supplies, but also clothing and other household goods. The docent uh, that, the, I'm sorry, the dormer that Grant Wood created by punching through the roof, allowing uh, a Western light and providing room for a desk. Painting storage racks can be found to either side of the dormer. These slide in and out to conceal and reveal the works that Wood was painting. These possess original wrought iron poles designed by Wood, as well as a full studded leather surface that Wood fabricated by using simple upholstery tacks and fabric that he then painted. Original wrought iron lighting fixtures designed by Grant Wood. A modern easel where his original easel stood the telephone stand on two levels, since one of them liked to stand while talking, but the other liked to, liked to sit. The north windows, where the hay used to come in from the alley, they now have a window box seat covering the radiator that was installed during Wood's time. At some point during his occupation of the space, Wood punched through the roof on the northeast corner, creating a separate sleeping room for his mother. The large arched opening is able to be closed off by a hinged metal divider held in place by a clasp. Between the main room and Hattie's new room was a radiator to heat both rooms with stylized floral grill work on the living room side of the radiator. Hattie's room was heavily modified after wood moved out uh, and thus now houses a couple of display cases holding a few artifacts, mostly metalwork of his time at the studio. Across from the entrance into Hattie's room is the bathroom, replete with built-ins and a sunken tub. This tub neatly fills the hole where the original internal ladder to the loft was and where the hay would be dropped down to feed the horses. It also allowed for both a bath and a shower in a rather confined and sloped space, thus serving both occupants one of which preferred to take baths while the other showers. The last small room is the kitchen, which has been heavily modified and is in a state of disrepair. There was no stove during Wood's time, only a hot plate, but a small stove in his, was inserted by a subsequent tenant. In addition, the more modern refrigerator has been removed since Wood only had a modest icebox. The skylight, however, was original which was still quite a novel thing in the 1920s and 30s. The docent giving the tour has a few props to assist during the tour. First and foremost, we are fortunate to have several black and white photographs of the space as it looked when Wood lived there. These are used and shared by the docent to help make the space come alive for the visitor. These historic photographs aid the visitor's experience greatly. They demonstrate how Wood used the space and how the visitor can see how the space was then and how it appears now. And there are occasional details in the photographs that do not appear today, such as the curtains that used to hang, separating the sleeping area from the rest of the room. Not only would these draperies allow for cutting down on drafts and the more efficient heating of the sleeping area, they also served as stage curtains for the small theatrical productions Wood and his friends would write and perform in the studio, thus establishing the first community theater in Cedar Rapids known today as Theater Cedar Rapids. In addition to the historic photographs, the docents may also use reproductions of a few of the works that Wood created while he lived in the studio. We had these made to their exact dimensions on masonite, a particle board frequently used by wood and used with these same pieces. These reproductions include Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, Daughters of the Revolution, Young Corn, Woman with Plants, which is a portrait of his mother, and of course, American Gothic. These five works represent a nice cross section of the works he created while living and working at the studio. Each has a different story 
and uh, to tell, and the docent is prepared to tell that story. Looking at all of the changes Grant Wood made to the hayloft, it is clear how he transformed the space to make it into an efficient home and studio for himself. One that would also accommodate his elderly mother uh, and often his sister. It was during his 11 years in the space that he created some of his most significant works of art, which resulted in achieving national renown. This is due in large part to the studio. Transforming the hayloft into a studio and home was transform transformational to Grant Wood's career. By living rent-free in the hayloft, Wood was able to give up his teaching position at McKinley Junior High School and paint full time. This allowed him to take on serious commissions, beginning with the 1925 series of paintings he created for the J.G. Cherry Company in Cedar Rapids. While Wood had been able to take on the occasional commission, this was an important series of nine paintings used by the Cherry Company at various trade shows to display the dairy machinery that they were able to manufacture. The success of that commission no doubt prepared him for several future commissions, including the successful commission for the stained glass window up at the Veterans Memorial Building. This commission, in turn, led to a transformational trip to Germany in the fall of 1928 to oversee the manufacture of the window. His first-hand exposure to Northern Renaissance masters, including Hans Memling, helped to transform Wood's painting style from Impressionism to his harder-edged mature style. His trip to Germany, in turn, resulted in the creation of compositions such as Woman with Plant and American Gothic. There were other contributing factors, of course, but the trip to Germany in the fall of 1928 is often cited as critical to Wood's development. And all of, the, all of this starts with the work on the Grant Wood studio. It seems highly unlikely that the sequence of events precipitated by the transformation of the hayloft into a home and studio would have unfolded in quite the same way. The studio, therefore, was not only transformed by Grant Wood, but was also so very transformational to his career. It is remarkable that this small 975 square foot hayloft had such an enormous impact on Wood's life and career, one which resulted in one of the most iconic American paintings of all time. Thank you. Are you gonna give me a time warning? Yeah, <laughs> five and a two. Okay. Five and a two. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. As Valerie so kindly introduced me, I'm Victoria Munro, the Executive Director of the Alice Austin House. Um, this has been a truly wonderful weekend, my very first time in Iowa. As you can hear, I have an accent. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm originally from New Zealand, um, but I've been living in America for 25 years, um, fairly much all of which uh, spent living in New York City. Um, today, um, I'm standing here to give you a presentation that I wrote two years ago. And we're essentially in a very different world. And a lot of things have happened at the Alice Austin House. Oh, we need. Can you speak up the microphone? How is this? Much better. Great. So, and, the, and video is okay if I'm over here? Great. So yes, we've experienced uh, a massive amount of change and you know, this idea of home and what that means to us has become incredibly significant, I think in lots of different ways. And I really want to acknowledge all of the presentations of my colleagues um, this weekend and the various notions of home and connection for artists to home um, and how that's 
made me think of so many different things uh, in relation to my own presentation. So I'm quite lucky to be um, having this Sunday positioning. And, you know, it's time for a little lesbian period drama. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Austin House. It's located on a four acre park um, on the waterfront of Staten Island. So it overlooks, as Valerie said, the Baranzano Narrows uh, with a view of New York City, Brooklyn, and also Hoboken. The house itself appears as a Victorian Gothic cottage and was originally a two room Dutch farmhouse built in 1690. So it is one of New York's oldest homes. Now, originally, when the Alice Austin House was saved, it was slated for demolition during the 1960s, and a group of concerned citizens came together and Friends of Alice Austin was formed. And this was quite a formidable group, including people such as Edward Steichen, Bernice Abbott, Margot Gale, um, and such. And they really had this incredible vision to create a museum that would be a living, breathing, photographic museum. And some of that vision got lost along the way. And part of that is very much due to um, the interpretation of the museum's namesake, Alice Austin. Here we see Alice at 22 years old in her striped dress, one of the most famous photographs of Alice taken by her uncle Oswald. Uh, she was already an accomplished photographer by this stage. And I know it would be, I know some of you in the room know Alice and her work, but it would be remiss of me not to explain to you that she received her first camera at age 10. And that was a gift from Uncle Oswald, who was a Danish sea captain and traveled the world and brought back lots of fantastic things. The other thing that you need to know is that Alice Austin resided at this very address because her mother was abandoned by her father when she was an infant. So the two room Dutch farmhouse, which had been extended over the years was purchased in 1844 by Alice's grandfather. It was intended to be a holiday home, but because the sanitary conditions in New York City were really horrific, um, the Austin grandparents had lost two of their sons and decided to move the family to Staten Island for healthier living. Um, Alice was not born at the house, but would move there when she was very, very tiny. So therefore she grew up in a world where she was surrounded by adults. Her grandparents lived in the house. Of course, her mother was there with her, her aunt Min, her uncle Oswald, and also her uncle Peter, who was a chemist and very interested in the, the chemistry of photography and taught Alice some of that. So Oswald and Peter would then transform, and when I say transform, that's kind of a rich word. They made a closet in the upstairs of the Alice Austin house, a small closet into a dark room for Alice. It never had any running water um, and, or electricity. So Alice Austin left us a legacy of around about 8,000 photographs of a changing New York City. Now, whilst it wasn't uncommon for women to take up photography at this time, it was very <coughs> rare for them to work outside of the studio. So Alice is essentially one of the first uh, photographers to take her camera onto the streets and she would take up to 50 pounds of photographic equipment on her bicycle into the city and, and photograph what we see as a period of massive immigration and various roles changing in the workforce in New York City. Um, this is Alice's partner, Gertrude Tate, standing above. Alice is seated. It's a penny portrait taken just up the road from the Alice Austin house. The pause that COVID has given us has been phenomenal for the Alice Austin house. I'm going to talk about some of the transformation within the house that was achieved by 2019. 
But one of the benefits to us perhaps not being open to the public, redistributing um, labour amongst our staff has meant that we've been able to achieve projects within our collections and understanding of Austin's life that we had always wanted to do, but had always been chasing our tails. Um, we now know we had always thought that Austin and Gertrude had met in 1899, but in fact, it's 1897. And every year is very significant in this history. And of course, as uh, Valerie mentioned, we are now a nationally designated site of LGBTQ history, which was an achievement um, that we were awarded in uh, 2017. So of course, it's really important for me to show you a quick few photographs of Austin. So this is a rare image that I really like to show because Alice is actually smiling. Um, so this, uh, this is Alice and her, both her friends named Julia. Um, they are situated just in the front of the house on the side by the porch. And what's really interesting um, about Austin, uh, Austin's work is a lot of it is located inside or around her house in terms of these personal photographs that weren't necessarily meant, well, definitely weren't meant for public consumption which are so interesting to us now in understanding her and the life of her and her friends. So she really used the home as a backdrop. She used the entire gardens as an outdoor studio. Uh, and that's something that I, I'm very, very, very interested in today. And I'm interested in the way that Austin used the space as a safe space for her queer friends and for women. So what does queer safe space look like? And how did Alice set up mechanisms to have it be very functional for her and her friends to have as much freedom as possible and explore creatively? Here are some interior shots, not, not taken inside the Alice Austin house, but Austin did also photograph men as well as um, her woman friends. The 1890s were her most prolific period. She was traveling around the world. She was upstate. She was having multiple relationships with women. Um, a very interestingly, uh, a wonderful photographer named Jeb, who some of you may have heard of, said, well, now that you've outed Alice and Gertrude, you get to talk about bad Alice. What did she do before the 56-year relationship? Um, so this is Alice and her friends. They were called the Dunned Club, nicknamed so because they did not allow men into their clubs. And this is on the edge of the lawn at the Alice Austin house. Um, the photograph in petticoats and short skirts, incredibly irreverent, with fake, fake cigarettes, is actually taken in the rectory of St. John's Episcopal Church, just <laughs> up the road from, from the house, uh, in fact, the church where Alice was christened. Uh, and Alice takes multiple photographs of her fan, friends in uh, affectionate poses and often um, switches each member and tries all different compositions, a lot of them with a very Victorian eye towards geometric shapes that, that the bodies form. Um, but impressively, you know, the garments, the neckties, um, these people would have had to have posed for quite a long time. So she really has this very distinctive eye. Um, but what is incredibly clear after going many scholars, but also including myself, working for years and years with Austin's work is you know very definitively when you're looking at an Alice Austin photograph. Um, this is a photograph of, of her relatives on the beach. I love this composition. And here's Alice perched on a fence post to capture the moment of a a race, a motor car race. Alice was the first woman on Staten Island to own a car and she knew how to fix it. She rolled with a toolkit 
And looking out at the photographer who's taking this photograph is Gertrude Tate. And it's like they're sharing a joke. You know, look at what Alice is doing. Um, this photograph is referred to um, in uh, Heresies, which is a publication that came out. It's Heresies number three, and it was the lesbian art issue. Anne Novotny published an essay. Now, any of you that have done any research into Alice Austin, tried to find books on Alice Austin, might realize that there's really only one book that came out in 1976, and it's by Anne Novotny. Anne Novotny was a lesbian um, researcher and author, and she could not have published Alice's World had she outed Alice in that book. She did say that it was her hope that people understood that Alice was in a loving relationship with Gertrude Tate when they read the book. But what she did do was in that same year was publish a multi-page article in, in the lesbian art issue, which included a notation about this photograph and this very, uh, you know, insider joke that seems to be going on with Gertrude and, and the photographer. And just quickly um, to say, Alice Austin also photographed the quarantine stations, um, which again have come up as a very uh, intense and sensitive issue during our own quarantines. Um, she photographed them for 10 years on Hoffman and Swinburne Island. She was employed and paid to document the sanitation uh, facilities which were of course a new technology and her works were displayed at the Buffalo World's Fair in 1901. Um, so it becomes, it's triple fold, so many reasons why Austin's work is not necessarily acknowledged in the way it should be. And one of the reasons here I'd just like to say is that uh, a lot of writers have said that she had no ambitions for professional a professional career. I think otherwise. Um, Austin accepted paid work for her photographs. She went back for 10 years to these islands. Uh, she photographed uh, people on the street of New York City, which she called street types. She copywrote her photographs. She self-published uh, a book called Street Types of New York City. Um, she also sold photographs of her travels to her friends and we have letters documenting them paying her. Um, so I would say that that's very wrong. And I do know that there's some new scholarship that's coming out and being published that um, does not really acknowledge this and puts Alice back at very much in this amateur category. And one also has to remember that the word amateur had a very different meaning in Austin's time. So now we talk about some of the wrong pathways and um, areas where, you know, um, the Austin House had lost its way a little bit, more than a little bit. They stopped acknowledging um, any of uh, Austin's uh, life and activities and friendships and the meanings of those friendships and their interpretation of the house and the site. And it was really only the queer community that acknowledged the truthful history of Alice Austin. And there was a very um, well-known um, march down Highland Boulevard and they hung a dike preserver on the lawn and Barbara Hammer actually included it in her film, The Female Closet. So how did we start to change? Um, one of the things that did happen for us, obviously, was that other groups took more and more of an interest and there was obviously a change in board leadership that became more open-minded at the Alice Austin House. So um, it was really an achievement of um, the uh, New York LGBTQ Historic Sites Project and the National Park Service to rewrite and amend the the national designation for the house to become um, a site of LGBTQ history. At that time, the only things that the Alice Austin House was actually doing was um, 
allowing inclusive weddings to happen on the lawn and allowing the Pride Centre to have their coming out picnic. That was it. So we became a site of significance and reinterpretation needed to happen. And that was when I um, took on the role of executive director. There was plans for a complete renovation of the galleries. And you do not need to look at this slide closely. It's uh, simply to show uh, all the areas of interpretive um, space that could be gleaned from the galleries. So this is um, what the dining room looked like uh, when I started working at the Alice Austin house. It was filled with antique furniture, none of which was Alice Austin's. Alice was evicted from the house, uh, Alice and Gertrude in 1945. So most of her possessions were lost. Uh, therefore, we don't have a large material collection from what was in the house before. So the board had used a photograph of Alice's dining room and attempted to recreate it. What this did was, um, you know, it took up the entire space, but you might notice that there is only one photograph in this room and it doesn't have a tag. This is the reinterpretation. We're able to cover several of the themes of Austin's work, allow full classroom groups into the space, and uh, also display Alice's camera and really tell some of the history of her involvement with photography and the types of uh, glass plates that she worked with. Um, this is the uh, dining room, the, sorry, the parlor before. So we only had two historic rooms in the house. And um, this one also only had three of Alice's photographs on display. I think in total, there was around about 15 to 20 photographs in the house of Austin's. When I first visited the Alice Austin house, I left, when I left, I did not know that Alice was a photographer and I did not know that she was a lesbian. As a queer photographer and artist, that might have meant a lot to me. And today, the entire entry has been, uh, we've exploded the photographs just for this purpose to sort of create an entry voice. Um, and because we don't have Alice Austin's voice, we have a lot of other letters to her. Um, it was really important for me to use quotes from some of these letters, but also from contemporary um, authors and scholars and people that have experienced the space so that we become a site of active story time. And that is really where we are at today. So all of our programs were redesigned, um, rewritten to be inclusive of Alice's story um, placing Alice and Gertrude front and center, really focusing on all of the work. And that's programs, whether they're taught, you know, um, K through 12 and to adults. Uh, we work specifically also with gender sexuality alliances and SAGE populations, which is queer seniors. And then we have two contemporary galleries at the Alice Austin House. There's three shows that are presented per year. And of course, as an effect of COVID, we now have virtual tours um, that you can see all of those shows from the last few years. So this is the show that was the opening exhibition um, in 2019 when we reopened the spaces. And believe me, I know if you've worked in a historic house, I was on the end of a paint roller to get this <laughs> through. Um, and also just a note, we are a parks department, New York City Parks Department owned property. So Friends of Alice Austin, the nonprofit, works to preserve the property, raise funds, runs all the programs. And realistically, without these friends groups, uh, the New York City 23 sites would fall into the ground. So what happened during COVID? My park, four acres. It was full. Everyone was looking for a seat outside. One of the things I really struggle with with museum spaces is 
whether or not people feel welcome to come in. Of course, we've all done countless DEI trainings, talked about this, how to become more welcoming spaces, but I felt at the end of the day, watching everything that was happening with COVID and my doors were closed, did I really need to make it that much more welcoming to have them come in the museum or was it that I wasn't recognizing the park as the cultural anchor it needed to be? So reinterpreting the exterior. This requires many, many voices. So I worked with the Pratt Graduate Center for Planning and the Environment. Um, over the last year, I had an IMLS grant to work with also non-traditional scholars um, to really look at what the barriers are to the park, physical, but also um, interpretive um, things that need to actually happen in the park. Like if you come to the park, people don't actually understand because I don't even have a sign that says this is the Alice Austin house once you're in the property. So most people don't even recognize that that little white house, the, any of the significance to it. And part of the problem with parks and landmarks is they're not allowed to do this, right? So how do we think about new and inventive ways to really solve some of these obstacles? I'm not give, gonna give you a full presentation on this because this is just what is happening now. But, there are things that I dream of, and that is getting rid of the white picket fence. Alice never had a white picket fence. I see it as a barrier, but it also doesn't stop people from coming in the park. It doesn't provide the house with any safety. So increased visibility on the street would also mean openness. At the rear of the property, I have another historic house that's landmarked that's falling into the ground. So the ability to have a larger visitor center that's purpose built for us would help preserve the house, but also have the ability to, you know, we would have the ability to run, you know, much more extended education programs. And we also own the side meadow, which could also have an amphitheater for performance and be much more inclusive for the community. We also own a separate garden, which uh, could be developed uh, into a native garden space. That's just one idea. Alice Austin was also the founding member of the Staten Island Garden Club. So creating all of these ways to wander and taking down barriers, my suggestion is not to mess with any of the preservation of the house, to be really, really reflective uh, about what is uh, significant um, in the landscape but to enhance all of that so that it is a space that people can happen upon and hopefully learn more about Austin without the expectation that they even need to set foot in the museum. So, and of course we have the waterfront. So we're really at this point thinking of these moments of invitation and the next step is a pilot project to create a queer garden at the rear of the Alice Austin house with plants that talk to each other, plants that are non-binary, that change sex, and really be able to um, have an experience where we can bring classes to it and tell a story with that garden, which is around about a 15 by 25 foot space. Um, so it's all new <laughs> and I hope I was able to just touch on a few things there for you and give you a little bit more of a well-rounded taste of where we're thinking we could possibly be in 20 years and over there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Can you can you hear me all right? Okay, good. Uh, first of all, <laughs> I feel a bit like a caboose that's been trailing after this wonderful, wonderful excursion. We've had so much to learn, so much to absorb, and I'm really grateful to Sean for hosting this event, uh, to Maura for putting it all together, 
a miracle, <laughs> and to Haas for co-sponsoring it. Um, what I'd like to do is to give you a little insight into the property of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, which is located in East Hampton, New York, in a community, a very small kind of backwater called The Springs. There's a little controversy over whether it's actually The Springs or Springs, but I have chosen The Springs because I'm, uh, I'm orthodox. As the steward of the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center, the former home and studio of Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock, I believe that understanding the relationship between the artist's surroundings and their creative practice is crucial to interpreting their abstract imagery. Actually, I think I'll go back to that first slide so you can get a sense of what the landscape looked like. Uh, this photograph was taken by Martha Holmes in 1949, so it shows you the openness and that little body of water behind them is called Akabonic Creek. By relating their paintings to the indigenous context, viewers can appreciate the strong influence of that place on their artistic vision. And I think this is especially enlightening in the case of Pollock and Krasner because their achievements are essential to the development of abstract expressionism which is considered an urban phenomenon with its roots in the New York City art world. Now, both artists received their training in urban settings. Pollock studied sculpture at Manual Arts High School in Los Angeles and dropped out in his senior year, which was 1930. He moved to New York City to attend the Art Students League, where he studied with Thomas Hart Benton, who, of course, was Grant Wood's colleague in the Regionalist Triumvirate. But Pollock grew up on farms and in small towns in the rural West. Isn't this adorable? He's, he's the cute one in the middle, uh, the, the youngest. This was taken when he was about three years old. He had four brothers, and this was taken on the family farm in just outside Phoenix. Actually, it's where Phoenix Airport is today. So anyway, he had grown up in uh, the rural West, and he later attributed his sense of spatial expansiveness to the vast horizontality of the land, which he experienced in his youth in Arizona and California. And the photograph of him with his father taken on the North Rim, his father was an unsuccessful farmer and he changed his professions to become a surveyor. And he was responsible for laying out the road to the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And when Jackson was a teenager, he went and worked with him on that project. Although he later downplayed Benton's influence and disingenuously dismissed him as, quote, a strong personality to react against, unquote, Pollock gained not only technical know-how from Benton, but also an attitude toward the source of artistic stimulus that would remain with him long after he outgrew his teacher's approach to representational subject matter. Benton prided himself on having personally observed every character and situation depicted in his scenes of contemporary life. And he encouraged his students to base their imagery on firsthand experience. Now Pollock took that to heart, but for him, experience provided the springboard rather than the subject. Even after rejecting Benton's regionalist aesthetic, transitioning through the influences of Mexican muralists, surrealism, and Picasso, and developing his distinctive personal style of all over abstraction, Pollock stayed faithful to that approach, only he turned it around. Instead of picturing what he experienced, he expressed how he felt about his experiences, often in response to natural phenomena. Although Krasner was born and raised in Brooklyn and attended high school and art school in Manhattan, she described her East New York neighborhood as rural, not a city. And this Jerome Avenue, or Jerome Street, as it was known then, is the street that she grew up on. She was, she was actually born in Brownsville, but the family moved to East New York when she was quite small, and that's where she attended school. And there she is on the porch of their house in, Brown, in Brownsville, in uh, East New York, with her sister Ruth. This is Lee and this is Ruth. 
On her way to elementary school in the early 1920s, she walked past yards filled with beautiful flowers. I loved it, she recalled. A backyard with irises and wild daisies, bridal veil and lilac, and roses on all the fences and in the backyards. She later credited that experience as the origin of her nature-inspired imagery, which would not develop until she, after she left the urban environment in the mid-1940s. Prasser created no landscape paintings as such, or if she did, none has survived. Her initial training at the Cooper Union and the National Academy of Design was highly traditional, based on figure study from casts and live models, or herself if she didn't have the money for a model. And here you see a self-portrait that she painted in the basement of her parents' home. Uh, she is holding a little flower, and behind her is a fern. So you can see there is some nature reference there. But this was done under the direction of Leon Kroll, who was one of her teachers at the academy. However, she had an epiphany in 1929 when the Museum of Modern Art opened an exhibition of paintings by leading European modernists. As Krasner's nephew, Ronald Stein, remarked to me, that's when Lee stopped going to temple and started worshiping at MoMA. <laughs> Needless to say, this newfound enthusiasm did not go down well with her instructors at the academy, one of whom was, went so far as to advise her to, quote, go home and take a mental bath. And you can see this very Cezanne inspired still life. That's an example of her transition to modernism. And here's another example uh, modeled on a very, very similar Matisse of 1915, I think it is, that was in MoMA's collection. Krasner left the academy in 1932 and Pollock finished his training with Benton the same year by which time the Great Depression had devastated the economy. With over 25% of the workforce idle, opportunities for young emerging artists to forge careers were virtually non-existent. Fortunately, thanks to various government employment programs, especially the WPA Federal Art Project, which ran from August 1935 through early 1943, they and many of their contemporaries were able to develop as artists throughout the period. And these are just a couple of examples of the type of work that they were doing while they were on the WPA. But in 1937, while earning her weekly WPA paycheck, Krasner enrolled in the Hans Hoffmann School of Art and learned the principles of cubism, which she applied to figure studies and still life arrangements as well as non-objective mural designs for public buildings, none of which were executed. She joined the American Abstract Artists and exhibited her neo-cubist paintings in their annual group shows. In 1941, she and Pollock were invited to participate in an exhibition of American and French paintings. At that time, his work was, as his brother Sanford described it, abstract, intense, evocative in quality. When Krasner saw it for the first time, by her own account, she was bowled over, those are her words, not only by its emotional intensity, but also by its innovative character. And this painting, which is now in the Tate Gallery in London, is the painting that Pollock submitted to that exhibition of American and French paintings. The one of Krasner's, which was very like the one I just showed, uh, is now lost. This caused her to rethink her devotion to cubism and to embark on a quest for a more personal, subjective, and expressive way of painting. This transition continued after she and Pollock began living together in their Greenwich Village, in his Greenwich Village apartment at 46 East 8th Street in 1942 and until the end of the WPA in 19, early 1943 after which their financial picture was pretty bleak. Now the day was saved by Peggy Guggenheim, who included one of Pollock's paintings, and uh, here is the one, now known as stenographic figure, in her avant-garde gallery, Art of This Century, on West 57th Street, and was so impressed, and it's a long story, so I'm compressing it, 
that she became his patron. His contract with Guggenheim provided a $150 monthly stipend and famously a mural commission for her Manhattan townhouse. And that mural will return to the Stanley Museum, University of Iowa, when it reopens on August 26th. And an annual solo exhibition at the gallery starting in November 1943. Within a year, Pollock went from, become, from being an unknown artist with no prospects to the protege of one of the foremost collectors and promoters of modern art. To say that this put him under pressure is an understatement. And to release that pressure, he drank. Pollock had been a heavy drinker since his teenage years and had been treated on and off for alcoholism and depression throughout the 1930s and early 40s. Now, the periodic binges that made him unreliable and exacerbated his mood swings threatened to derail his nascent career. And here he is uh, at the home of Thomas Hart Benton on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, Benton became uh, more than just a mentor to him. And even after he no longer was associated with Benton, he would periodically visit and also contacted him right up until the time of his death. So Benton was a really a seminal figure in his development. And I think that that's often underplayed, but we really, we really have to acknowledge Benton's influence. So Krasner, uh, who had put down her, her, her own ambitions in order to promote him, not that she stopped painting, but she just didn't promote herself, was desperate to keep Jackson on track. But it was an uphill battle in the thick of the New York art world where diversions as well as drinking buddies were plentiful. Now, Fortune smiled on them in the summer of 1945 when they accepted the invitation of their friends, Reuben and Barbara Kadish, to share a beach shack on Laos Point in the Springs, a rural backwater five miles outside the village of East Hampton on eastern Long Island. And this is at the time, it was just a fisherman's shack with no plumbing or water. And it had, um, uh, it was pretty much uh, just a, a leaky roof place to sleep. But now this cottage just recently sold for over a million dollars. So it shows you how times have changed. Anyway, East Hampton had been a mecca for landscape and genre painters since the 1870s, when Winslow Homer and the Tile Club came to town. In 1883, Lippincott's magazine dubbed it the American Barbizon, where the Art Students League had established a summer outpost and critiques were held in the village hall. The first custom-made studio residence was built for Thomas and Mary Moran in 1884, and the studio, as it's known, is a National Historic Landmark and a Haas member site. It was soon followed by other, mostly seasonal homes, where artists such as Child Hassan, Ruber Donahoe, and Bruce Crane painted the charming scenery and quaint rustics. But by the time Krasner and Pollock arrived in August 1945, the Depression and World War II had taken their toll on the local economy, and the earlier generations of representational painting, painters was dying out. Summer influxes of emigre surrealists escaping from the sweltering city had kept the art colony lively during the war years, but they were transient. Krasner had decided that she and Pollock should find a seasonal rental, only not for the summer. Her plan was to sublet the 8th Street apartment, which would finance a cheap winter rental in the springs, where they could get down to business without distractions. There were no other artists in the neighborhood, and it was 100 miles from the New York art world. And there it is. So this is East Hampton Village is down here. And if you took a horse and wagon up this road for five miles, you would get to Springs. So as I say, there were no other artists in the neighborhood. And it was 100 miles from the New York art world fishbowl in which Pollock felt exposed and vulnerable. He rejected her idea as crazy. But after they got back to town in mid-September, he changed his mind and proposed instead that they leave New York and move to the Springs full time. Then Krasner thought he was the crazy one. 
Not only did they did isolating themselves from the city's stimulation and opportunities seem risky, but they had no money to buy a house. Pollock was adamant, however, so they set about making his pipe dream come true. As it happened, they did have a foothold in the area. Their friends, the critic Harold Rosenberg and his wife Mae Tabak, a writer, had bought a summer cottage in the springs in 1944. The Rosenbergs let them use it while they house hunted, and within a few weeks, they found a property that suited them, a homestead overlooking Akabonic Creek with a barn that could serve as a studio. The asking price was $5,000, which was 5,000 more than they had, but they could rent with an option to buy. And the local bank agreed to a $3,000 mortgage if they could raise the $2,000 down payment. 40% down in cash, which Krasner hoped Guggenheim would lend them. So in November 1945, November 5th, Pollock and the newly minted Mrs. Pollock, they had married on October 26th, moved in with no guarantee that Guggenheim would come through. But a few days later, she arrived to check out the place with one of Pollock's collectors, William Davis, who encouraged her to agree and the loan was forthcoming. As Pollock wrote to Reuben Tadish, and here you see the letter, after getting Guggenheim's approval, all there is to it now is a hell of a lot of work and it doesn't frighten me. In April, 1946, they took title to the property at 830 Springs Fireplace Road and started customizing it. The shift to country living was, as Pollock put it in a letter to their friends, Ed and Wally Stratton, a little tough on a city slicker. His farm boy years were long behind him, and the house, built in 1879, had no plumbing or central heating. Wartime rationing was still in effect, so they were limited to one bucket of coal a day for heating and cooking. And an interviewer once asked Lee, well, what did you do when you ran out of coal she said, we went to bed. <laughs> they also had to use wood, which Pollock reported burns like paper at $21 a cord at a time when $21 was about half a week's wages. Thankfully, his new contract with Art of this Century, oh, I should point out, here's the coal stove. And this thing on the side, this is where the hot water was cooked. So thankfully, his new contract increased his monthly stipend to $250, and their mortgage payment was only $37.98 a month. I think I hear some groans in the audience. So that as their bank records show, they were able to afford what they needed, even if the Springs house didn't provide the comforts they were used to in their Greenwich Village apartment, like steam heat and an indoor toilet. But in spite of the hardships, especially during the first winter, there were compensations. Writing to her friend Mercedes Natter not long after the move, Krasner described the, quote, trials and tribulations of trying to get settled, unquote, but added, it's very beautiful out here. Pollock echoed that observation in a note to the Stratons, written in June of 1946, to report that he was having the barn moved to open up the view to Akabonic Creek. The country is wonderful, he declared and asked, when are you coming out? In August, confirming the date for their visit, he informed them, we have a boat and a goat. The most significant advantage was quickly apparent in their work. The isolation, which could have been stultifying, had the opposite effect. And both artists experienced bursts of creativity that signaled new directions. The transition was remarkably rapid especially given the conditions under which they were working. Krasner staked out a space near the Franklin stove in the back parlor, probably the warmest room in the house. And this photograph was taken a little bit later. But um, Pollock's studio was upstairs in an unheated bedroom, only about 10 by 14 feet. Eat your heart out, Grant Wood. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> but it has a north window and another one facing east toward the creek, and that's the view you see here from the upstairs window. Although the view was partly blocked by the barn, and if you look here, 
You see this concrete pad? That is the original barn floor. And then there's a lean-to section over here that had a dirt floor. And after it was moved over to the north side of the property, that was simply left in place. So the block, although the view was partly blocked by the barn, it evidently had a positive effect on Pollock's imagination. The first group of works he painted in that room became the Akabonic Creek series, a collective title that Pollock himself applied. While their individual titles don't relate to the body of water, which is what you see in the back there, or the surroundings, there are hints of nature influence in constellation, bird effort, and magic light. His imagery was still pictographic and symbolic, but the series is notable for its bright palette and looser structure as compared to the darker, uh, more congested compositions uh, he was creating right before his move. It's as if the expansiveness of the field and the salt marsh and behind the house and the broad coastal vistas at the nearby bay and ocean infuse his imagery with color and light. The Akabana Creek series was quickly followed by Pollock's Sounds in the Grass series, a transition to all over jet abstraction, using thick impasto to build up lively surface textures. Here, the painting's titles refer directly to the intangible natural phenomena that inspired them. Sounds in the grass, croaking movement, shimmering substance, eyes in the heat, for example. Without literally picturing those phenomena, and after all, how can you picture croaking movement? Pollock invented elusive imagery to express their effect on imagination. Now both series, 16 canvases in all, were shown at Art of This Century in January, 1947. In his note for the catalog, Bill Davis remarked on the show's somewhat gayer mood, and the critic Clement Greenberg pointed out that, quote, Pollock has gone beyond the stage where he needs to make his poetry explicit in ideographs, unquote, calling attention to the more upbeat tone and expression in the new bodies of work. Krasner, too, was rapidly developing a novel approach to abstraction, independent of subject matter per se, yet not directly reflecting the natural environment in its imagery. Like Pollock, she abandoned even the most stylized references to objects in space, creating instead hermetic fields of color and gesture that she later called her little image series. Begun in 1946, it occupied her for some four years. Most are untitled, but the titles of the early works in the series suggest that Krasner, who always named her paintings after they were finished, recognized analogies to nature in Shell Flower, a veritable mosaic of agitated paint dabs, nightlife, which could suggest fireflies flashing in the dark, and noon with its scallops of radiant pigment. By 1947, after years of experimenting with liquid paint, Pollock adopted it as his primary material using it to create classic poured paintings that earned him international acclaim. Before he decided to number his works instead of naming them, many of the seeming, seemingly non-objective compositions were given titles with earthly and celestial references, such as Enchanted Forest, Shooting Star, The Nest, Comet, Watery Paths, Sea Change, and Reflections of the Big Dipper. Even during the heyday of his so-called drip style, people saw analogies to nature in his numbered works, adding descriptive titles like Autumn Rhythm and Lavender Mist, which coincidentally has no lavender in it. And after returning to more conventional painting techniques later in his tragically short career, he once again used nature as an interpretive guide. The deep, grave rainbow, ocean grayness, moon vibration. It seems clear that the environment con continued to play an indirect, even subliminal, but crucial role in Pollock's artistic imagination until alcoholism and dissipation ended his painting career in 1955. The following spring, he had a friend with a bulldozer dig up glacial boulders on the property 
and pile them behind the house with the aim of carving them, turning directly to nature in a last dish, a last ditch effort to reignite his creative spark through sculpture, a tactic that sadly failed. The stones remained in their natural state, untouched by the artist who died in a car crash in August 1956. After Pollock's death, Krasner painted a group of three darkly voluptuous canvases that expressed her anguish and torment, combining plant and animal forms in grotesque couplings. They seem to have served a cathartic purpose, for in 1957, during her first summer working in Pollock's former studio, while still mourning his loss, she began a series of upbeat, nature-inspired abstractions. Later collectively titled Earth Green series, they were characterized by one of her friends as an antidote to her grief. Among them are Sun Woman 1 and Sun Woman 2, Spring Beat, Thaw, and The Seasons, a monumental canvas that testi testifies to nature's fecundity and regenerative power. Throughout the rest of her career, and she died in 1984, Krasner would, remain, would maintain that she could not imagine herself, as she put it, outside of nature. It was part of her, just as she was part of it, and it profoundly informed her creative vision. Although she had a studio in the city, the spring's environment continued to serve as a source of inspiration and imagery, which tended to manifest itself even when highly stylized. She often turned to others to name her painting, and those who did came up with titles reflecting a range of natural phenomena, from the darkly turbulent cobalt night and night bloom to the lively pointillistic flowering limb and August petals. And I should point out that in 1953, Krasner suffered a broken arm. She fell and broke her right arm, which was her painting arm. So in order to paint, she actually devised a strategy of holding her hand with her left arm and painting, which is one reason why her style became so agitated like that, rather than the sweeping strokes that she was able to do when she had free range of motion, which she ultimately did again. There was a seed series in 1960, as well as major a major canvas dedicated to Gaia, the Greek goddess of the earth. Her final painting, Morning Glory, finished two years before her death, incorporates the first line of a poem of that title by Howard Moss and directly paraphrases the plant's flower and leaf shapes. Visiting the Pollock Krasner property today, it's easy to see why both artists blossomed, if you'll forgive the pun, in this environment. Away from the art world's influence, they responded spontaneously to their surroundings, internalized and synthesized those impressions, and invented new ways of expressing their subjective responses. In 1946, when Pollock said, the country is wonderful, he could hardly have imagined just how full of wonder it would be. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Victoria, and thank you, Helen. I think what was really great about these three presentations is they remind us that these sites remain active and that they are singular and there is no individual model by which they are preserved, created, and function today. So I think if we want, we were gonna have just a few moments for Q&A. Um, I wanted to see if there were any questions in the chat. Pardon me? Okay, great. And so are there any questions in the room? So I have, oh, Lisa, go ahead. Lisa, go ahead. These are fabulous presentations. Thank you. And I wanted to ask Sean, I think he's written and I haven't read it, but could you tell us a little bit more about the 
inspired? Do you know what was why it happened? And um, Kate told us today that she thought okay, it was really strange. Yeah, Sean, if you could come up to the podium. To answer. Thank you. Um, I do not know enough about the 1932 fire um, in the studio, um, except that it did allow him to change the flooring there. Um, I, uh, I understand there is a recently discovered film um, in which uh, there's an interview with Dan Wood Graham and she talks about uh, things that were destroyed in the fire itself. But I have, personally have not done enough research in, uh, with regard to that or what caused it, so. I wanted to ask Victoria a question um, because we were talking about it um, uh, in some of our downtime of speakers, this idea of what COVID has meant um, when most of us uh, who are practitioners had to close our doors. Um, and it did create a scenario in which a lot of people were able to work on archival projects and other types of projects that had been put on the back burner for many years and sometimes decades. But in addition, something that Victoria has alluded to, which is the activation of other spaces on your property and what that means, and what that um, thinking is. And so you start um, in deference to time rush through those slides and um, I thank you, but I'd love for you to come up and sort of talk a little bit more about what it means to be a contemporary space that is accommodating visitors today and what it means to then extend out into a landscape that was also such a key part of Alice's work and life. Thanks, Valerie. And yeah, sorry, I ran out of time there a bit. But, you know, um, it's it's really um, the idea of um, sort of working through being inclusive in the interior and inclusive of everyone's histories and stories and, and Alice's uh, complete story. Um, the natural progression is to look at what, you know, the house was really one of her muses. And that includes the park. It's, it doesn't sit separate to the property, right? But the property is really the space because you're looking in that site, which is preservation, where the floorboards are pressure. So you can't have too many people in a space at once, simply because of the preservation of the house and the wear and tear, but also now because of COVID and social distancing, look at ourselves right now in this audience. But um, the park's a different scenario. And being that it is so integrated into her story and her work, and it is part of the studio, I view it as part of the studio, it's then a site where um, it can be activated for community partnerships. And um, actually, it, it, it's a site that we had already been taking photographs on and with groups, but not as fully as we are today, uh, activating all areas where there's, uh, this summer there'll be outdoor exhibitions. Uh, we'll be hosting Staten Island's uh, Photoville on, on the site and throughout the meadow. We'll be having a stage where um, I invite uh, and curate community groups to perform Saturdays, Sundays, There'll be film nights on Thursdays, Tuesdays, poetry, and really um, allow a full breadth of um, creative um, performance and engagement. Um, and of course, you know, we do things like yoga at the site and dance um, and that kind of thing. But it's really to embody that idea that we are a living, breathing museum and we can change and we can be inclusive and at the same time invite those moments, be able to have a platform where we can talk about Alice and have moments where we can educate um, and hopefully be really inspired by her and her world. And like I said, I'm very, very interested in the garden as a safe space um, and how that translates to, to lots of different communities, the North Shore community of Staten Island is extremely diverse. 
um, and to really take that a step further um, with Alice as our lead. Um, for as long as you can stay, <laughs> there is a question from the audience, uh, from our online audience of why was Alice evicted from her home? And while I know the answer, I am going to let you. I'll answer that really quickly. Uh, Alice lost all of her money in the stock market crash of uh, 1929. Um, her and Gertrude struggled to stay in the house. They had a tea room. They tried to, uh, apparently Alice wasn't as hospitable as Gertrude. Um, she liked to uh, host who she, who she enjoyed, but um, they were unsuccessful and very sadly um, were evicted from the home. During that process, um, Alice was very fearful of losing all of her glass plate negatives and she gave them over to the Staten Island Historical Society, which Gertrude and Alice had been active with. And so they have the larger collection, which is now known as Historic Richmond Town, but um, in very recent history have not, uh, do not acknowledge the relationship between Alice Austin and Gertrude Tate. And as museum professionals in this room and scholars and such, I'd just like to say that the job of archi archiving and everything else that we end up touching is an extremely precious one. Because when I was preparing the slideshows to celebrate Alice and Gertrude's relationship, I asked the archivist of 27 years that worked with that collection to pull a past perfect on photographs that Alice took of Gertrude Tate. And there was only about eight so I looked through manually because, of course, there were so many more. And this is a person that's identified most people in Austin's photographs and continuously Gertrude was listed as unknown woman. Thank you, Victoria, for bringing it back to something that we discussed earlier in um, the conference. Um, yes. I have a question for Helen. Great. I'm sorry. Helen, um, can you tell us if Krasner foresaw the home as um, a museum? It's not exactly a museum, but a pilgrimage site. And did, was the foundation established during her lifetime? Did she plan for this? Or how did it come about? Yeah, try to repeat the question. Yes, a question from Sue Taylor, uh, who did a wonderful presentation, by the way, for us uh, in our lecture series on stenographic figure, that painting that Pe Peggy Guggenheim uh, responded to. Uh, the question is whether or not Lee Krasner foresaw this uh, as a historic site or as a museum, and whether or not her foundation was created during her lifetime. It was not created during her lifetime. She left provision in her will to create it. She envisioned it as a philanthropic organization that gives grants to artists, and that is indeed what it does. The Pollock Krasner Foundation is headquartered in Manhattan. It's been in existence since 1985, and it has given millions of dollars to needy and worthy artists all over the world. It does incredible work, but it is not affiliated with the House Museum. Her will specifically separated the two entities and offered the house or the property, which as you see here comprises five buildings. And the, it was offered to any organization, a nonprofit that would be willing to take it over and run it as a quote unquote, public museum and library. So she did envision it as a public site. Unfortunately, she didn't leave it any money. <laughs> so they got the money, we got the real estate. Uh, they have been very, very good to us. They've been very supportive. They did help us establish our endowment. And uh, so even though we're not technically affiliated, we are sort of joined at the hip. But we belong to the State University of New York at Stony Brook's private foundation, the Stony Brook Foundation. So those are two completely separate foundations. And the Stony Brook Foundation took over the deed to the property in 1987 and the museum was opened in 1988. And it comprises the house. There is the rock pile back behind it. This is a, an automobile garage. All five buildings were original to the property. This is a little utility building that is now our museum store. Behind it is another utility building that was an extremely important piece of equipment. 
the outhouse, <laughs> now decommissioned. We actually have a restroom over here in the garage, or one with a flush toilet. And this is the barn that was moved from the area over here to the north end of the property to open up that view to Akabana Creek. And inside the barn, the major change that we made was to remove a floor covering that had been installed in 1953 when Pollock had the building winterized. So that covered the wood floor that he had installed after it was moved, on which is the residue of all of his most famous board paintings. He used that surface from 1946 until it was covered in 53. And then after that, it was just a white, and again, he used masonite. He, like Grant Wood, liked masonite, a nice firm surface, but he had these baseball games that his brother had made on masonite, and there were a lot of them left over. So that's what they used for floor tiles. They were, they were very frugal. They never threw away anything that was remotely useful. So that was put down on the floor in 53, painted white, the walls were painted white. So instead of it being a rough wooden structure, as you see in the photographs of him, the famous photographs of him at work, it became a clean white cube. We took up that floor covering and revealed all of the colors and gestures from his most famous paintings. And on the walls, you'll see the remnants of Krasner's painting. She liked to tack the canvases up and, and work vertically. So you'll see the remnants of Gaia, portrait in green, memory of love, and all these other pictures that she painted in that space. So it actually reflects the two of them quite, uh, quite significantly. And we have a virtual reality tour that returns some of those paintings to the studio. You put the headset on, you feel like you're in the space, the wood walls come back, the paintings come back, and then the paintings come back on the walls as it was in the 1960s. So it is not the real thing. We don't present it as such, but since we don't own their art, it's the only way we can actually expose people to the art in the environment where it was created. And it's very effective. People really enjoy it. It's expensive, but we got a grant. Thank you, Helen, tell, tell us, or your, your audience maybe, since I am, emphasized in my talk uh, earlier, about the journey to get to the site. <laughs> How do your visitors, because uh, I suspect we have some islands here, <laughs> know, uh, know where you are exactly. So how do your visitors find you? Well, find us on the internet. <laughs> That's how everybody finds everything these days. But we're uh, in a resort area. East Hampton, of course, is a famous resort area. And one of the things you have to be prepared for when you come is the traffic. And we're open from May to October, so the best time to come is in May and October, because in the summer, the local roads, like if you've ever been to the Cape, you know what I'm talking about, there's one road in and you're on it. So that can be a little bit challenging. But as you can see, our parking is quite limited. And with COVID, again, it makes us rethink things because we, by necessity, and I think, you know, all of us who run historic sites have had to really you know, take, take a step back we have decided to go by reservation only because when we had people popping in and we're right on the road this this parking lot leads right out onto springs fireplace road so we're extremely visible and people would just pull on the curb and park on the on the road and it, it really wasn't working but it's a much better experience for the visitors to be able to be taken around personally and it's less crowded, less wear and tear on the property. And so people will go on our website, book a tour and do it that way. And it really has worked much better. Jane, I think you had a question. Yeah, I had uh, two questions. So with Jack Moore Larson's housing, which was present there at Belmont Square, how did you get to know Jack and The questions about partnerships. First of all, with Jack Leonard Larson Longhouse, which is another uh, site nearby established by the, the uh, fabric designer Jack Leonard Larson. It's a 16 acre sculpture garden and his own personal collection of decorative arts, which since his death last year, uh, no, I guess it was 2020 yeah. he died, uh, he envisioned it, as, it has been open to the public for many years, 
but he did envision the house being open as well. And they're in a transitional phase now, but you can definitely visit the gardens and it's absolutely wonderful. And part of our, we have a, a network like Haas, but local uh, called the Hamptons Arts Network of about 20 different sites, uh, cultural attractions in the area. People think it's just, you know, all about the beach and the big houses, but no, we have a little more going for us than that. And a lot of these organizations uh, have clubbed together to publicize all the different cultural attractions that are available. Now, as far as Stony Brook is concerned, we are 65 miles from campus. So we don't have a lot of direct activity, but we do have interns. Uh, we have students who do research and we have a study collection at our Southampton campus, which is about 20 miles from the Pollock House because we took over the Long Island University campus there about 15 years ago. And we have a beautiful library with the archives. We have the catalog resume archives. We have photographs, we have documents. So that was one of Lee's. Remember, I mentioned that she wanted a public museum and library. So that's the library aspect of it. And we have scholars come from all over the world to use our collection. We'll get the last one, Lisa. <laughs> we'll let now we'll let Lisa ask Helen or whoever privately. But let's go to the gentleman right here. I have a question about storytelling, specifically the management of storytelling at, at these great places where artists get so much famous stories that people would be back to other people when they say, "Well, um, and I'm curious because there's a short version you write in the brochure, a long version you write in the book scholarship visitors come with stories and so there's this interesting stories and so i'm wondering how that's managed and i'd like to start with victoria because i'm, I'm curious i noticed that visitors to austin you know, the Thomas austin house have uh, been pretty tiktok videos they go viral they're, they're great videos and they're very interesting so are you prompting some of those um, efforts or some of those from staffers because uh it just seems like people are so excited about sharing stories from the house in austin uh, reinterpretations uh yes so all of the programs are grounded in storytelling so there is a lot of prompting and uh, uh support for it uh, um being able to make uh connections and 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 teaching and creating programming in, in a way that is accessible to all um and and so that's what you're seeing and certainly that very viral TikTok was um uh, uh an offshoot from a podcast that i was the very first person that was interviewed for someone lived here but yeah the site is extremely inspirational too so yeah we try to help that along with the storytelling yeah i, I think i I'd like to just speak to that in a sort of overarching way is that I think increasingly um, the ethos and philosophy of sites across the network, all of which range so much in terms of what they retain in material culture, their location, how easy it is to access, the list goes on and on and on, is to really tap into um, contemporary engagement in storytelling. And I think it, it is the way in which Haas sites differ um, from what is accomplished through exhibitions and catalogs and museum going, but also because for the very reason that it is in domestic space and therefore is a gateway for everyone, I think importantly in, uh, and Victoria has touched upon it and Maura has touched upon it. We have all sought to reevaluate how we commune with our personal space, how we will commune with it in future, which is really just we're starting to unpack. And so these personal singular environments that were the hub of so much life lived, remember these artists were living in real time. We silo them in segments of um, art historical inquiry or periods of interpretation. But when you go and you stand there, there is that connection back to the personal and the connection back 
to one's own experience. And I think that coupled with the fact, and this is what I always say about hospice, the creativity is in the DNA and it's still there in a place like Grant Wood Studio where it is represented in all its materiality because you see the things that he created to live and work sometimes in process, like on the Paula Krasner floor, sometimes by linking inspiration, like the photographs to specific spaces that you encounter in Alice Austin. There's something else that happens at Haas sites. And this to me is what I would like you all to think about when you go and contemplate whether you would like to make a pilgrimage close or far, <laughs> is that that spark, and that life lived in the confluence of those two things together resides in actually every single person. And when we're small, we embrace that about ourselves and we don't question it. But as we learn, and in my instance, it was the violin, which I pursued for a very long time, even with like important uh, musician instructors from Juilliard, but at a certain point, you make a decision about whether you're going to be an artist with that capital A in air quotes, right? And when we make that shift, we often put all of those aspects of ourselves aside and we start to question them from, should I paint the wall this color? Are the objects I'm collecting okay? Should I do some drawing or make a tintype or whatever it is? And what sites like this invite you to do is to re-examine that questioning and to tap back into that via the people who live there, via the contemporary programming and the contemporary artists that these sites actively engage with, but something perhaps more important and more visceral is to do it for yourself. And that is the message that for me, I want to every one of these sites is worthy of conferences and monographs and exhibitions. And every time you go, it's new and I believe that. And so as the spokesman for all 55, <laughs> I say to you, that is what this is about. And I hope we've captured some of that magic in the last three days that then will force you to go out in the landscape or in a site itself, uh, not just tomorrow, not just next year or whatever these current changing times hold, but really hopefully for the rest of your lives. What a perfect way to end this weekend. Um, this has just been phenomenal. And I love all the feedback we've been hearing amongst each other. And it just, whoo! <laughs> Before I forget, there's one last thing that is going to be taking place downstairs. Valerie's book. Um, and it's really Haas's book in many ways. I mean, she championed it right, but it's all about everything we've been talking about. And it is, it is available downstairs and uh, she'll be available to sign them. And also just check out the museum store because it's wonderful. Um, I have to do a few last minute thank yous because I've gotten so much credit from the stage and I'm like, well, I'm not, it wasn't alone. So anyway, I want to again extend my deep appreciation for the speakers and the session leaders and also the people who have attended both in person and virtually because this has been a very dynamic, thoughtful discussion and it was such a wonderful way to crawl back out of quarantine. So thank you very much. Um, second of all, uh, the word miracle is just used, um, and I think that the speakers and the virtual audience would agree that the miracle of this running smoothly would not have happened if it weren't for Luke McLaren. <laughs> Jim asked for a favor. I met him on Thursday, and oh my goodness, so thank you so much. Um, next, I'd like to thank Jim Hayes and the National Advisory Board, especially the committee that was planning this, that selected the papers, that went, that through their networks gathered these amazing scholars and uh, professionals in this, uh, in this arena. And those members are Wanda Korn, we've heard her name several, you've met them all throughout this uh, process, but Wanda Korn, Joni Kinsey, Trip Evans, Jay Malosh, and Jim Hayes. So thank you to the committee. 
And finally, um, this event wouldn't be made possible if it weren't for the support for ha with support from Haas, the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art, and the Iowa Arts Council. So thank you again, and thank you guys for coming. This has been wonderful.